Hi there. Today we're going to talk about Newton's second law for rotation. So our first goal is to simply introduce it. So it's very similar to Newton's second law that we used for straight line motion. Some of the forces equals ma will have an equivalent law for rotational motion. And then we'll simply apply it in a particular situation. So we'll do a pretty simple example of how to um, apply Newton's second law for rotation. So what is it anyway? Well, it's essentially the rota rotational equivalent of the sum of all the forces equals ma. So what we have here is an equation that says the sum of all the torques is the rotational inertia, I, multiplied by the angular acceleration. That's what alpha is. And these things are vector quantities, at least the torque and the angular acceleration, just like force and acceleration are vector quantities. So, what you note here is that it's a similar looking equation where torque plays the role of force, where the rotational inertia plays the role of mass, and the angular acceleration plays the role of the regular old linear acceleration that we're so used to. Okay, so we're going to handle this in a very similar way to how we did force problems. So here is our basic method, and it looks an awful lot like what we did when we were solving force problems. So just as we did when we were doing force problems, our first step was to draw a diagram. Then our second step was to draw a free body diagram. We're going to keep doing that. We will then apply Newton's second law for rotation. In some cases, we'll actually do both. We'll apply Newton's second law for straight line motion to get an equation involving forces, maybe even two equations involving forces if there are forces in more than one direction. And then we'll apply Newton's second law for rotation. In the example we're going to do, we're just going to do a rotational system. So all we need to do is the torques. And then finally, we, that uh, step three will give us an equation and we can solve the resulting equation for whatever it is we're interested in. Find the rotational inertia or find the angular acceleration, you know, something like that. Okay, so here is a fairly basic example of how we're going to apply this. So we have a pulley. The pulley is a solid disk. It's got a known mass and it's got a particular radius, so those values are given. Our pulley is mounted on a frictionless axle to pass it through the center of the pulley. We want to know the pulley's angular acceleration when we apply a constant force of 8 newtons to a string that's wrapped around the outside of the pulley. So, where do we start? Where do we start? So, we'll draw a diagram, but then what really starts us off on the analysis is drawing a free body diagram. Okay? I think, in fact, before we can do a free body diagram, it's good to draw a diagram anyway. And why do we need to know that the pulley is a solid disk rotating around the center? What's that going to allow us to do? Does that give us anything, any piece of information we need? Well, it does. So, it will tell us what we're going to use for rotational inertia. So a solid disk that rotates about an axis passing through the center has a known value for its rotational inertia. It is one-half mr squared. So now we know what to use for, for the rotational inertia. Okay, so here we go. There's our pulley. And we're going to throw some forces on here. So, this thing is mounted uh, on a horizontal axis, so it's got a weight acting down, through, acting through the center. There's our force F. Now, in the problem, we were, we're not actually told which direction this force is. Uh, I think it's pretty safe to assume that it's directed tangent to the circle along the edge. But you don't have to have it here where I, ha where I show it. Okay, you could have it at the top going horizontally, you could have it on the other side going vertically, you know, you could pretty much put it anywhere. Uh, it really is not going to change anything we do. If we put it somewhere else, as long as it always acts tangent to the circle, no matter where you put it, then uh, you're going to get the same result. 
Okay. Any more forces? Well, if these were the only two forces we had, this thing would accelerate down. But it doesn't. Okay, it actually doesn't go anywhere. It rotates, but the center of mass of the object stays where it is. So we need some other force. Well, that's actually a normal force, which is applied by the axle on the pulley. And the normal force in this case has to cancel out the combined effects of gravity and the force that you apply by pulling on the string. Okay, so having F in the same line as these other two forces kind of simplifies our picture. Uh, if we had an F with some horizontal component, then the normal force would have a horizontal component to cancel it out. But it really doesn't, doesn't matter too much. It doesn't change anything about the analysis, and we'll see why in a minute. Okay, so there's a free body diagram that could apply in the situation we're dealing with. Okay, so let's see what's next in our method. So, then we want to actually just write down the equation, sum of all the torques, is the rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. So we have uh, three torques here. Now we've got to do some similar things just like we did for forces. Okay, so for forces, what we did is we chose a positive direction. For torques, we're going to do the same thing. So in this case, if you exert a force F down on the right side of the pulley, then it will and it starts from rest, then it will rotate clockwise. So I'm going to define clockwise as positive. So we pick a positive direction just like we did when we were doing the sum, the sum of uh, forces. Now this thing here, we're going to take torques around the center. So this is basically equivalent to picking a direction to do forces. You know, we picked either the x direction or the y direction we were, when we were adding up forces. So for our torques, we're actually going to pick an axis about which to consider the torques acting. Okay, so in this case we'll pick an axis that goes right through the center because the, the pulley rotates about that, about that axis. Okay, so the nice thing about that, if you take torques through the center, then any force that passes through the point you're taking torques around doesn't give you any torque at all. Okay, so the mg force passes through the center, passes through the axis, so does fn, doesn't give you any torque. So we can take off those two forces from our diagram essentially. They're still there in the free body diagram, okay, but what we're doing now is we're really drawing, just reminding ourselves which forces matter, which are the only ones that give us torque, and in this case it's only the single force that you apply. The other forces don't come into the torque at all. And this is really why that's true, because whenever we add up torques, okay, so we look at our free body diagram, and usually on a free body diagram we show forces. To figure out what the force, is, the torque is due to any force, you apply this equation. Torque is Rf sine theta. Okay, so in our case, this is what R is. We can measure R from the center of the, of the pulley, that's the point we're taking torques around, to the line of the force any way we want, but this is the most convenient one because we were given a value for the radius of the pulley. So if we measure R horizontally out to the vertical force, then our equation says magnitude of the distance from the axis, that is the radius of the pulley, times our force F, times sine theta. Well, what is theta? Theta is the angle between the line we measure the distance along and the line of the force. So in that case, in this case, that's 90 degrees and sine of 90 degrees is 1. So we'll just get capital R times F for our torque. If you did this for the other two forces we used to have in the free body diagram, the normal force or the mg, well the point there is that they go right through the axis and so their R is equal to 0. Okay, so they don't give you any torque at all. Okay, so we just have this one thing giving us torque. So on the left-hand side of our sum of all the torques is I alpha equation, we have the single torque that we have left in our picture, the only torque that there is in this system, radius of the pulley times this force F. It's positive because that force will make the wheel spin in a clockwise direction, that's what we said was positive, if the wheel starts from rest. Okay, the pulley starts from rest. Okay, then we have on the right-hand side of our equation the rotational inertia, 
because it's a solid disk rotating about the center, the rotational inertia is one half m r squared. And then we have alpha, which is what we're looking for. We're trying to figure out what the angular acceleration is in this case. Okay, so we're just about done. All we need to do actually is rearrange our equation and we're all set. So one thing to notice is that one factor of the radius cancels out on each side of the equation, but we're still left with r when we're done. Okay, so we cancel out an r from each side and we're left with f is one half mr alpha. And then we are ultimately after alpha, so we just rearrange solve for alpha. So we'll move, uh, we'll multiply both sides by two. We'll get two f is mr alpha, then divide both sides by mr, and we'll get alpha is two f over m times r. F was given as eight newtons, and the mass was given as two kilograms, the radius was given as half a meter, so we get 16 newtons on the top, and we get two kilograms times half a meter, so we simply get one kilogram meter on the bottom. If you work it all out, you get uh, a numerical value of 16. The units will actually come out to per second squared. And then we're just going to throw in a radian. So we treat radians very differently from any other units. It's a very unusual thing. We just sort of throw it in whenever we need it or take it out whenever we don't want it. Okay, it's very unlike what we do with other um, units. But in this case, we write down the value of alpha as 16 radians per second squared. So usually thetas are in radians, omegas, angular velocities are in uh, radians per second and alphas come out in radians per second squared. Okay, so uh, there's a fairly basic application of how we apply Newton's second law for rotation in this setting where the system is only rotating as opposed to translating, which means it has some straight line motion. In this case, there was no straight line motion at all. All we had was rotation, and so we have this method we go through is which is very similar to what we did um, earlier in the course where we did the sum of all the forces of MA, Newton's second law. Now we're going to do something that's analogous for rotation. Sum of all the torques is I times alpha. Okay, so that's everything for today.